I planned this talk as more of a general you know, state of AI talk, hence the name, state of AI, uh, with a few specific examples that I'm aware of that I think you might find interesting. Um, I've layered in some plugs for, for Watson, just because uh, I know that this is related and a lot of people will be interested in hearing uh, about Watson. Um, but uh, essentially, um, yeah, I'm going to go over a general like, sense of, of, of the state of AI. And I, I usually like to speak in a pretty collaborative way. So if anybody has any burning questions, feel free to just raise your hand or shout something out if there's additional information you have to add to anything I'm saying or questions or clarifying questions you have. Um, there's a lot to talk about. Uh, I don't have, um, I've intentionally kind of like ripped it up into buckets so that we can burn through it. A lot of this stuff, many of you may know. Some of it, maybe some of you don't. Uh, so I guess with that said, without further ado, I'll just start it up. Oh, by the way, this is my information in case you want to follow me on Twitter or look me up on LinkedIn or you have a question you want to email me about. I run a team called Watson Developer Labs, uh, which is a new team we're staffing up for. Um, and uh, more on that in just a little bit. I'll give a shameless plug, don't worry. Uh, OK, so just the agenda, what I want to talk about. So I like the level set. I, 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 my dad grew up reading the, the English Dictionary, the Oxford English Dictionary. So I'm always um, careful to define the terms before I use them so that you know what I'm talking about and I know what I'm talking about. Um, and, and then after we do a little uh, terminology definition, that'll lead us right into uh, you know, maybe the, uh, an overview of the different approaches to artificial intelligence that I've seen of late. This is, uh, this is just me doing uh, you know, industry-wide, not just competitive analysis, but analysis of, of the uh, emerging artificial intelligence business community, et cetera. Um, and, and so take that for what you will. Uh, and then I'll give you a few examples, mostly from the Watson world, because that's what I'm aware of, uh, in terms of chatbots, robots, and virtual reality. Then I'll give the shameless plug, and we'll take copious amounts of Q&A. So if you did want to just write down your questions, I'll be sure to answer more than two at the very end. OK, so terminology. Uh, first of all, uh, who knows, who's ever heard the term machine learning? I know, it's a little softball here. Um, so <laughs> machine learning is, is, in my opinion, uh, and there will be a lot of my opinion in this, so take that for what it's worth, uh, what we mean when we say AI right now. As far as I'm aware, there's not much out there that is unrelated to machine learning, uh, nor is, have we reached, uh, so, sorry, machine learning is what I would refer to as narrow AI. Has anybody heard the term narrow AI? OK. Uh, what is it, then? <laughs> you, you nodded like, yeah, I know. <laughs> like, I don't know. That's OK. No worries, no worries. He raised his hand behind you, too. What you got? That's a good, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. So I agree. Um, narrow AI, as he said, is uh, AI, artificial intelligence slash machine learning algorithms, which is what they're made up of that are good at tackling specific problems. So for example, you can imagine uh, at IBM, you know, we like to talk about Deep Blue and Jeopardy, right? Well, those things were purpose-built artificial intelligences that could really only do Jeopardy and really only do chess, right? It couldn't give you relationship advice or have a child or decide to be interested in art, right? That's general AI. When we're talking about in, uh, real intelligence, uh, some people say consciousness, um, but there are certain requirements, right? Like it has to be able to do more than one specific thing that it was uh, prescriptively trained for. We're talking about emergent behavior that, of course, conforms to certain guidelines and rules, and there's a lot of talk going on about those. Obviously, you guys have probably heard of Elon Musk's stuff lately, the universe.ai that he launched, which is um, essentially a, an interface for any machine learning algorithm that you can take, and you can have it uh, play a number of games or do a number of things in the same way that a human might, so that it would learn to manipulate and use the internet the same way we do, and manipulate and use different control schemes the same way you do. So basically, it's like a layer in between what the AI sees and what it does, where it has to, just like us, send keystrokes and understand from a pixel arrangement perspective what's on a page. And you can take machine learning algorithms via, that, that have been trained via deep learning techniques uh, or unsupervised learning techniques that um, you can then train up, and it's really cool to see it happen, where you can go from, hey, I don't know what this is, to, okay, I'm really great at playing Pac-Man, or whatever it is, right? It's cool to see that concept, which took an entire giant corporation like IBM, and more recently, Google with TensorFlow, and what they did with AlphaGo, which is a really complex game, a very long time and entire divisions to accomplish. Now we're starting to see it be a little bit more democratized, which I'm personally very excited about. Um, so that's narrow AI. Uh, general AI, I think we've, we've kind of defined by, uh, by, by defining narrow AI. Uh, deep learning is a technique by which 
you train machine learning algorithms uh, to figure out certain patterns, right? So the easiest low-hanging fruit example that you hear at conferences like this and others is around uh, visual recognition, right? So the easiest thing to get a machine learning algorithm to do is to do some basic pattern recognition. You can teach it very easily, for example, to recognize what is and isn't a specific picture that you give it at its most basic level. Um, importantly for deep learning uh, or other machine learning uh, training techniques, and obviously mostly leveraging neural networks, um, that is something that you only have to do when you're training your own machine learning algorithm to do what you want it to do. Uh, you don't have to do that when you use a cloud-based platform like Watson, and I'll get into that in a minute. Cognitive is a word that at IBM and other places, actually, other companies are starting to adopt this. Um, it refers to generally uh, smart systems, smart applications, um, smart ways of doing different job roles. It's a pretty broad term. It's meant to be sort of an industry standard term that's a bit of a, a blanket term that you could use to mean machine learning algorithms or any kind of AI, right, that's trained anyway. Um, so that's cognitive. And then machine learning as a service, uh, artificial intelligence as a service, well, that's what our platform and some of our competitors are. Uh, that basically means um, just like you would with, what's another example? Uh, like imagine if you're making an application and you want to use Google Maps. Well, you're not going to rebuild an entire mapping system. You're basically going to use an API provided by Google or whoever you want to choose, right? And that is a something as a service, in this case mapping. Um, and it basically gets you a shortcut to the value you want. So in our case, we have 30 services. Um, you call them via REST API. They're all available uh, online. And if you Google Watson Developer Cloud, you can see what they are. Um, and you can basically do things like advanced visual recognition, um, create an entire chatbot, do data analytics, stuff like that, uh, much faster than if you were to have to train your own machine learning algorithm locally. Now, that doesn't mean that it's the most relevant or applicable in every single situation that you'll come across. Um, there are certain instances in which using a locally based, personally trained, purpose-built machine learning algorithm is actually better than using a cloud-based platform. Either you don't have an internet connection, maybe you're going to space, or maybe uh, you just wanted to do one very basic thing and you don't want to be beholden to other companies for what you do. There are use cases in which building your own, rolling your own uh, makes sense. And in fact, that's becoming even easier to do than it ever has been before. Um, and that actually kind of segues into, I'll skip to the sort of other approaches that people use before I go into detail in Watson. Um, so cloud-based platforms include us, Microsoft's cognitive suite of, of services, um, and some of our other competitors. Uh, was I clear on what cloud-based is? Does everybody understand the difference? Like, basically, you don't own the algorithm. You call the algorithm that we've been training, right? Does that make sense? OK. Um, and uh, so we're not alone in that. Uh, Locally-based algorithms, obviously, you guys have heard of TensorFlow, right? You guys heard of TensorFlow? So there's a bit of a, a misunderstanding about TensorFlow that I want to clear up here because, again, along the lines of terminology, this is such an emerging industry, it, it bears repeating, right? So TensorFlow is not the same as Google offering, uh, offering for free and as open source the neural networks that they use to train their machine learning algorithms. It's not. It's helper libraries that will help you build neural networks and train your own. Does that make sense? So it's not quite the secret sauce. but they did a brilliant job in marketing it as such, and, and, and it's very popular now, and it's one of the most, I would say it's the most popular at this point, unless somebody wants to dispute me, open source uh, helper library framework for training your own locally based machine learning algorithm. Um, along with that, companies like NVIDIA have decided and, and have seen an, a market opportunity and, uh, and claimed it, which is great, uh, to, they saw that people were using the computational power of the GPU to, to accelerate uh, GPU training. And so they went ahead and made an SDK that will let you do it faster. So basically, you can do more A-B testing, more unsupervised learning, more iterations faster using the computational power of an NVIDIA chipset using their purpose-built SDK uh, named CUDA with something like TensorFlow, and they also have it for other ones as well. Um, so, uh, and then, of course, there's the open source uh, approach. There are really great marketplaces like Algorithmia. Uh, and also companies, full companies, that are based around building open source algorithms that anybody can use and building a solutions layer around that as well. So these are the different models that companies are, uh, you know, experimenting with now. Um, I think there's been enough traction with all of the different approaches that I don't think any of them are going anywhere anytime soon. Um, I think we're still in kind of the wild west of what is, quote unquote, the right approach, and I think you're going to see a lot more clarity around that in the next uh, few years. Um, 
And so in terms, okay, before I go into that, so then I guess I, at this point, I'll tell you a little bit about the Watson platform. How's that sound? Bad, good, great. Sounds great, according to one person. That's enough. We have Quora. Okay, um, so this is the Watson Developer Cloud suite of services. I put up this rather boring page because it gives you a list of, of mostly the, the buckets that we divided into. So you've got language, speech, vision, and data insights. Um, and I'm not going to go so much into the weeds which, with each one, but I'll talk through a high level and you can go to the website yourself. And uh, there's demos for every single product that you can actually play around with that will show you the features. But also, there's a fork on GitHub link that you can actually fork it and do it yourself if you're a developer and you want to test out how it might work in your scenario or alter a few different things, kick the tires basically, right? Uh, and then in addition to that, of course, there's a bunch of documentation. You can see uh, details about the pricing. But essentially, just like every other API platform, cloud-based platform, we offer this with a free tier uh, to all the services, so anybody can begin prototyping for free. Um, all you do is you sign up for what we call a Bluemix account. Bluemix is our public cloud. You can think of it as IBM's uh, version of AWS or Heroku or Azure, or things like that. So basically, you sign up for that. It's free. Uh, there's a 30-day free, mostly unlimited trial. After that, you still get the free tier of the Watson services. You'll also get to check out all the other things that Bluemix has on offer. Some of them are really cool. Uh, I recommend checking out OpenWhisk and checking out uh, Node-RED and a few other options there. Um, but essentially for our purposes today, in order to get started prototyping with this, all you would do, sign up for a free Bluemix account, um, get your API credentials, and, and go. Some low-hanging fruit is, uh, so I want to call your attention to Watson Conversation. Um, Watson Conversation is our bot training interface. It has a UI which is very, uh, which is along the lines of things like wit.ai or converse.ai, um, the Microsoft bot framework, Lewis, things like that. Uh, and that basically lets you create a dialogue flow with a lot of mm, error correction built in on, on the cloud side, uh, all without you having to do too much work. It's really interesting. Uh, if you get a chance, I'd check it out. If you pair that with speech to text in the speech section uh, and or text to speech uh, for, for, for response output, then you have a fully functioning chatbot that you can talk to, right? So conversational experience on a mobile device, chatbot you can talk to. Uh, and there's a lot more use cases, I think, than have been exploited so far in that area. Uh, we'll talk about that in a sec. So then moving on to vision. Um, and by the way, in language, there are a lot of other things that you should check out that are interesting. Uh, natural language class not classifier, personality insights, alchemy language. Um, these all give you extra metadata and information about what somebody means, how they're saying it, why they're saying it, what are the important themes, and things like that. Or, and even, are they angry? Are they happy, et cetera, tone analyzer. So visual recognition is our visual recognition service, obviously. Uh, but one of the key differentiators of this service and actually our platform that I like to talk about is the retrainability of it. So while you don't actually have to train up the machine learning algorithm yourself, and in fact you can't, what you can do with this service and a lot of them is build your own uh, essentially, I guess, infrastructure data system on top of what we provide you, which you then own. We see this as kind of a differentiator because we're not looking to collect people's information or their data or aggregate things about them. This is, uh, our, our business model's different, and so when we talk about, hey, you can build this on top of it and you can own it, we mean that. So an example that's brought up a lot with visual recognition uh, is one around agriculture, wherein uh, you can, obviously, all, any off-the-shelf cloud vision API will get you to recognize an apple, right? I give it a picture of an apple, it'll say, oh, this is an apple, right? But what if, you know, you, you are some company that uh, sells apples to supermarkets, right? And you need to know what are the red delicious apples and the, the you know, Granny Smith apples and what's the difference? Okay, one's red, one is, one is green. Maybe it will get you that, maybe not. However, what if you need to know what are the Granny Smith apples that have like a weevil in them or that have like a little blemish or that are a little bit malformed out of the tolerance for the shaping, et cetera? You can train it and build classifiers and classes within the subclassifiers that will get you to a ridiculous amount of granularity, and it, very quickly. Uh, the system works by submitting a package of images. You don't even need to submit negative images, honestly. You do in the demo. I, I recommend trying it out. Um, and then you can retrain the service to recognize pretty much anything. I did an experiment. I did a hackathon last year to see if anybody could come up with anything interesting using our visual recognition service and the custom training feature in virtual reality, and I was blown away by what people were able to do. There was a team that won uh, that built an open source tool that allowed users in a virtual reality environment to draw a symbol in 3D space, submit it to the system, and then have the system match that with an image. So in this case, it was, um, the, the tool is for training the service, by the way, to do it really easily. So in this case, it was like a key. You can go look this up too. If you just look up uh, SVVR, uh, Visual Recognition Hackathon, 
Uh, but basically, you could draw a key, submit it to the service, and then a 3D key would pop into the game world uh, because the system recognized a key that you drew. Now, in case you're not familiar with, with visual recognition services, um, you may not be aware that you really can't give it anything that's not real because it won't know what you're talking about. If it did, it would represent false positives for everybody else. So imagine if you want to um, understand what a key is, a real key in real life, right? So it needs to be able to recognize what that is and biasing it towards recognizing a drawing of a key in flat 2D space would totally mess up the model. Does that make sense for everybody else? So, uh, so this capability, as far as I understand it, is fairly unique among the cloud-based services, and it's, it's actually a strategy that we're applying to the different areas. There are other services that you can retrain. You can retrain services with custom corpuses of data. In fact, even in the conversation example, if you want to get extremely granular and, and, and really, really detailed, you can import a custom model for a specific industry so that it can automatically error handle for nomenclature, which may not be uh, something that uh, it could necessarily generally understand. Think about medical terminology, flora and fauna, maybe even financial stuff. Like when you start to get really in the weeds of specific industries and you want to make the error handling that much more accurate and you're ready to go to production with customers, that becomes a very useful feature. Okay, I've already spent too much time on visual recognition. Have a look, kick the tires. The demo's freely available, it's pretty nice. There's also other services called, or other features within visual recognition called like, um, Similarity search, uh, so you can search for one thing, get similar images of another thing, um, and, and other things some, such as that. I really recommend you try it out. And then finally, we get to data insights. So what's not on this list, I need to update this screenshot, is um, Watson Discovery. Watson Discovery is a new service we launched uh, that basically takes mm, variously structured forms of data and provides insights on it. It's a data analytics tool. I recommend you check that out as well. Uh, we started to do some experiments with uh, four third-party developers uh, or, or to showcase to them what would happen if you combine a working chatbot or a conversational interface with uh, the insights you can get from a Watson Discovery service. What would that be like? Would that be good for, you know, that, would that be like a ready-made package for retail? Hey, natural language, query our inventory here and get insights or whatever. So uh, there's a lot of, lot, of, lot of blue ocean there. I'm really excited to see what developers do, both in concert with other stuff that we have and just in general. So that's an overview of our services, and developers are using this now. Uh, it's been out for about a year um, to do all sorts of different things. Obviously, chatbots are really hot. Um, people, when they think of Watson, they think of data insights, so the Watson Discovery Service um, is something we're pushing a lot this year. Um, and you'll see this continue to grow. A general theme, and this is going back to the state of AI, with all of our services, all of our competitors, and industry-wide with artificial intelligence, is the commoditization of the base technology layer. So no longer is it that special, now that you can train your own machine learning algorithm, to have basic keyword recognition, right? Everybody can do that. And we see that going more and more in the direction of the base technologies are not the special sauce, but what is, is use case-based applications. Like if I come to you and I say, hey, yeah, you want to do you know, a customer care chatbot? It'll, re it'll, it'll reduce cost with your company by this much, and you'll be able to auto-route certain things, and customer satisfaction will go up. And here, it's ready to go. You can give it to your developers. You can alter and edit anything. You know, that's the sort of thing that begins to have legs going forward. And the more we can lean into that, uh, the better we become. And we've already undergone that path. Like Watson Conversation, a full bot training service, used to be a series of four different individual APIs, some of which have been sunsetted, others of which are simply used as a part of this, uh, this more complex purpose-built service. Does that make sense? It's a lot, it's a lot. Okay, I'm gonna take that silence, that absolute silence as a yes and move on. Um, okay, so emerging use cases. Yeah, I'll talk about one that we built uh, just to kind of showcase how, how not fully uh, settled these are in the best possible way. Like it's a really exciting time to be alive and in this industry for sure. Um, we built something called the IBM Speech Sandbox uh, and launched it at CES this year in partnership with uh, HTC for the HTC Vive, which is a virtual reality headset that you can walk around in and touch stuff in 3D space with touch controllers. So I, I had this built to showcase a number of things. One, uh, how a cloud-based platform might actually be useful. Two, how you might build a chatbot or a conversational experience in virtual reality. And three, that you could do it with Watson easily. Uh, we have a Watson Unity SDK, and we can allow users to make use of just two services uh, in order to build this experience. So basically, it is not called Cognitive VR. I thought I put the latest one, but I didn't. It's called the IBM Speech Sandbox, and here's a video of what, what it is. 
Not sure if we have sound. If not, it's okay. Yeah, it's, so this is basically what they're doing. Um, I'll talk over it, but it's meant to showcase audio interfaces in virtual reality. Uh, this is the brief tutorial, but basically uh, it's a God mode sandbox demo where you can point anywhere and create, modify, or destroy objects with just your voice. Um, there's a couple of things that are interesting about this. Voice control using a chatbot training system, thinking through how uh, in conversational interfaces might be applied with, in new areas in ways that aren't just slavishly like, here's a virtual bot here and here's a virtual bot there. So in this one, it's essentially uh, showcasing what it might be like to use your voice for certain UI features. So there you go. And, and you'll notice she doesn't have to use a wake word like, hey, Watson, or whatever. She's just saying things, and it's always listening, always streaming. Um, so she created a large gorilla and a small gorilla by using just a natural sentence. And the interesting thing that this highlights about Watson conversation, which is kind of invisible, is, is all of the error handling that it does for you. So if she had said, create a huge gorilla, it still would have made a large gorilla. And if she had said a tiny gorilla, it still would have made a, a small gorilla, right? And if she'd said make instead of create, it still would have parsed that as create. And those aren't things that are hard coded. That's just the system understanding contextually what make or create or huge is, right, in a sentence. So anyone can download this. And there's an accompanying how-to guide. So if developers are interested in either AR or VR or whatever the use case is really, but this was showcasing the, the Unity integration, um, you can go and rebuild this yourself. And we're working on, as part of a new initiative uh, with the team that I'm building, uh, making this a freely available bit of sample code on GitHub. Yeah, I know. It's just, you can tell this was a, a developer that liked guns. <laughs> I only fought the battles that I could fight, right? <laughs> so there are 200 objects in the game. It's kind of fun. Um, but mainly it's meant to give you a flavor for specifically audio interfaces and how they might be done right or wrong in virtual reality. This is not saying this is the perfect uh, way that it should be done. It's only meant to uh, show developers the art of the possible. So that's one use case folks didn't maybe think of. And by the way, we're seeing really a crazy amount of traction with non-gaming VR use cases. We're talking about training, therapy, education, et cetera. Um, so if you wanted to look at that yourself or rebuild it, check out ibm.biz slash Watson underscore VR. That's the how-to guide um, to showcase how we did it. Oh yeah, shameless plug, I'm hiring. So if you're interested for product managers as a part of Watson Developer Labs, which is my team, uh, which is focused on producing developer-facing solutions that help them use uh, Watson platforms that, or I'm sorry, IBM platforms that uh, both put IBM's best foot forward and also solve a real problem for developers. So uh, that's a lot there. And if you're interested, take a picture of that and look up that uh, number. OK, so um, at this point, I guess I'll just walk through a couple of other um, use cases uh, that, that you may already know, and then I'll take Q&A. So, Obvious use cases for virtual reality, uh, not virtual reality, <laughs> artificial intelligence, I'm getting my wires crossed, uh, would be you know, obviously any sort of conversational interface. I don't think we've struck pay dirt on that yet. I think, I think we would all agree most of the chatbots that are out there are essentially useless or they're one, one time use, oh, that's cool, and then they're, they're done. Um, but I think that you know, I'm not going to make a prediction like it's going to be 2017. But in the next couple of years, I really do think that chatbots are going to start becoming more useful because they're actually going to be starting to do the, the hard part, which is the backend integration. So really, chatbots only make sense if they can do something for me which I don't want to do myself. Uh, and so really low-hanging use case fruit that's there is ar around booking corporate travel stuff, right? Like who wants to rifle through all those legacy systems that we and a lot of other companies have? And you have to go in and, and, and cross-check different things. Well, what if you could query a system that would do that for you and not necessarily take action immediately, but bring you the results into that same UI as opposed to you having to log into you know, single sign-on, go to this page and go to that page and rifle through this and that. And I think that, um, that opportunity is there for a lot of different industries and a lot of different use case based stuff. It's just that you know, it's always the last mile, right? That's the hard part. How do I get a chatbot that integrates with all the back end systems? Is, the, is it easier if a chatbot can just give me the weather or something? Well, yeah, maybe, but it's less useful. So I think we'll start to see more really well thought out, coming out of stealth you know, opportunities for, for chatbots to really be useful in the different uh, forms that they are. Um, I think uh, you know, optimization of, of a lot of different processes. I think if we're just going to take a step back, um, the way that financial transactions are done, uh, the way that um, uh, laws are even implemented and legislated, the way that um, different 
aspects of our world are monitored and insights are gained is obviously going to change. I know that's really broad, but um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's machine learning algorithms and, and artificial intelligence are going to start to affect practically everything we do. They already do in ways that we don't even notice. I mean, uh, a, a lot of times we, uh, you know, if you're using Google Inbox, that's something that is powered by a machine learning algorithm that's going to tell you what's important and what's not. You can choose to, that makes me a little uneasy. I don't like when uh, things are happening invisibly in the background. I mean, it's already happening with ads, with auto-generated uh, sports recap articles. Those are a lot of times done by machine learning algorithms uh, or just even standard, you know, Excel sheets that decide what, what goes in there, right? Like, we should always say who won, and here's an interesting t statistic. Um, so things are going to start to happen in a more invisible way that will automatically personalize more and more of our lives for us. I hope that takes uh, a, uh, an enlightened approach as opposed to a, uh, an invisible approach that's a little bit uh, something we don't notice until it's already too late. But those are other use cases, use, uh, broad scale. So um, yeah, that's pretty much what I have. Uh, are there any questions? No questions. Wow. Nothing? Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, so I wonder, uh, I have a lot of uh, folks in my meetups who basically are startup uh, developers and data scientists, and they basically need, let's say, uh, chat capability for the app. Uh, so how should they engage with your program to, to use these APIs to, to build a product such as you know, a chat for customer service support? Right. So the question is about, hey, a lot of people want just a chat bot, right, for their app or experience or whatever. How would they engage with us to do that? Okay, so the first thing I would say is have a look yourself, not necessarily from your developer, just yourself, with the Watson Conversation Service. There's an overview video, there's a demo you can check out. Um, since you asked, I guess I'll, I'll show you the demo. Uh, or, or I'll show you, well, yeah, I mean, this will work. I, I want this demo to be updated, but for now, I guess it'll, it'll give us what Hi. we need. It looks like a nice drive today. What would you like me to do? It looks like the lights are already off. I understand you want me to turn on something. So you, you see that, you see why context is important, right? So one of the best practices that uh, should really be implemented for every chatbot is that it should remember what you said last and use that as context, but of course you need uh, some sort of cloud storage for that and a database that you've selected. It really is not all that difficult, but a lot of experiences just don't do that, you know, and it's very annoying if you're a user um, because it's something you expect. So turn the lights on, and here's what I'll highlight. Yeah. Um, make the lights go dark. It looks like the lights are Make the lights go off. Okay, so that's a bit of the error handling uh, in effect there. Now, it's not perfect, obviously, um, but it's important to note that this response was not hard-coded in there. So you're meant to give a minimum of five example responses for a given intent when you train it using the UI. And really, the UI is meant for anybody. It doesn't have to be developers. It's, it's essentially a visual dialogue tree that you can string things together. Anybody can understand it, and it's pretty cool. You can even test it in the UI. So you can test the changes you've made or the assumptions the system's made, and you can alter them. Uh, but what's important is that, you know, some of the nomenclature is not going to be there, and, and it can automatically parse for that and take action on a user's behalf. And you can actually go in as the application developer on the back end and see all of your user interactions and see which ones are false positives or where they were given the wrong one, and then go ahead and manually rebias it. You don't just have to wait for it to get smarter on its own, which is another nice and somewhat unique feature. Um, so it also ends up as sort of like a, da a, a data insights or, or a, a dashboard that gives you information about your users as well, an analytics dashboard almost. Um, and we're working on new features for that, too. Does that explain a little bit about how we think you might get started building a chatbot? Okay. And that's the back end. And then, of course, you can deploy a front end to whatever you want, whether that's a mobile application or a web UI interface. That, that's up to you. Yeah. So, so you're mentioning that, uh, you, that you guys weren't collecting data uh, about us uh, when uh, using this. Why not? Yeah, so let me, collect, let, me, let, me, let me clarify that. So we're not collecting data about the subclassifications that you determine are important to your business. For example, with the, uh, the visual recognition uh, um, uh, agriculture example, right? So we're not going to give to your Apple selling competitor the same subclasses that you 
you created. Those are wholly owned by you and not brought back into the system. Now, are we always retraining our machine learning algorithms and making them smarter? Absolutely we are, yeah. But that's, that's the base machine learning algorithm that you can take off the shelf and use as is, and so can everybody else. And I don't think there's a reasonable expectation that we would not make that smarter because that drives value for you. And of course, we need to have as much user input as possible, in addition to it just sort of um, scraping the internet all the time for images and whatnot. Does that answer your question? So you, hey. Hey. Um, <laughs> you said that, and I totally agree, the commoditization of this base layer of technology is sort of table stakes these days. What are some of the quote unquote special sauce combinations of APIs or capabilities that you've seen that you think are really cutting edge and potentially, you know, like that next step forwards for AI? Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, good question. So, I mean, this is boring, but the speech to text and, and, and conversation makes you get uh, a, a chat experience you can talk to and it can understand you. That's kind of like magic because all of a sudden you have, you, you've reached Uncanny Valley and you can start you know, talking to things. I think that's especially true with virtual reality. The presence, you're there, it's, it's, it's a very powerful thing. Um, if, I, if I take my, my IBM cap off a little bit, I'm really interested in what happens with self-driving. Uh, I think that self, uh, you know, NVIDIA is essentially giving away all of the stuff that anybody in this room would need to build to roll their own, which is crazy when you think about it. But I mean, if I, if I can go ahead and go train a machine learning algorithm which can steer my car, you know, from a software perspective, um, I think that's very interesting. That's not necessarily a combination of things, but you could imagine uh, that, that there would be um, different artificial intelligence agents at work in a more complex system that would work together. I think that's a very interesting thing as well. Um, I made a joke last year when I was doing a training class about uh, a, an, a Tinder for algorithms, like where they can just kind of meet and have algorithmic babies together, and it's silly, but it's kind of, it's you know, it's gonna happen in, in one form or another. It may not be called Tinder for algorithms, but, or Grindr, I don't know. But, um, yeah, let me, let me think on that. There are a number of really interesting examples of, of usage of different machine learning algorithms together or in concert that do really interesting things. Um, but I'm blanking at the moment, so let me, let me think on that. Anything else? Or I have no time to think. Thank you very yeah. Much.